بزرگو بھائی اور بہنوں السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ایس آئی آف انڈیا کی آن لائن بک ڈسکشن سیریز میں ہم آپ تمام کا تحدل سے استقبال کرتے ہیں وی ویلکم یو آل ان دی ایٹ سیشن آف آن لائن بک ڈسکشن سیریز ہیلڈ بائی ایس آئی آف انڈیا سب سے پہلے ہم اس پروگرام کا آغاز کرنے کے لیے تلاوت کلام پاک کی تلاوت کرنے کے لیے دعوت دیتے ہیں برادر سید احمد مذکر کو جنرل سیکرٹری ایس آئی آف انڈیا کہ وہ تلاوت کلام پاک سے آج کی اس نشست کا آغاز کریں برادر سید احمد مذکر اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اللہ یعلم ما تحمل کل انسا و ما تغیب الارحام و ما تزداد وكل شيء عنده بمقدار عالم الغيب والشهادة الكبير المتعال سواء منكم من أسر القول ومن جهر به ومن هو مستخف بالليل وسارب بالنهار له معقبات من بين يديه ومن خلفه يحفظونه من أمر الله إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم وإذا أراد الله بقوم سوء فلا مرد له وما لهم من دونه من واد صدق الله العظيم سروا اللہ کے نام سے جو بے انتہا مہربان اور رحم کرنے والا ہے اللہ ایک ایک حاملہ کے پیٹ سے واقف ہے جو کچھ اس میں بنتا ہے اسے بھی وہ جانتا ہے اور جو کچھ اس میں کمی یا بیشی ہوتی ہے اس سے بھی وہ باخبر رہتا ہے ہر چیز کے لیے اس کے یہاں ایک مقدار مقرر ہے وہ پوشیدہ اور ظاہر ہر چیز کا عالم ہے وہ بزرگ ہے اور ہر حال میں بالا تر رہنے والا ہے تم میں سے کوئی شخص خاص زور سے بات کرے یا آہستہ اور کوئی رات کی تاریکی میں چھپا ہوا ہو یا دن کی روشنی میں چل رہا ہو اس کے لیے سب یکساں ہیں ہر شخص کے آگے اور پیچھے اس کے مقرر کیے ہوئے نگراں لگے ہوئے ہیں جو اللہ کے حکم سے اس کے دیکھ بھال کر رہے ہیں حقیقت یہ ہے کہ اللہ کسی قوم کے حال کو نہیں بدلتا جب تک کہ وہ خود اپنے اوصاف کو نہیں بدل دیتی اور جب اللہ کسی قوم کی شامت لانے کا فیصلہ کر لے تو پھر وہ کسی کے ٹالے نہیں چل سکتی نہ اللہ کے مقابلے میں ایسی قوم کا کوئی حامی و مددگار ہو سکتا ہے بہت بہت شکریہ برادر محمد مذکر حضرات ہم دوبارہ آپ تمام لوگوں کا استقبال کرتے ہیں تحدیل سے آج کے اس سیشن میں وی ویلکم یو آل ان دا ایٹ سیشن آف آن لائن بک ڈسکشن سیریز بائی سائی آف انڈیا اینڈ وی آر ایکسٹریملی گلیڈ اینڈ آنر ٹو ہیو اے پینل فار ڈسکشن ٹو ڈے کنسسٹنگ آف پرومیننٹ اسکالرس رائٹرس اینڈ تھنکرس اف اور ٹائم and the book we have chosen to, for discussion today islami tamaddun kaini bahran or alazma dasturiya fil hazar al islamiya uh, which i think is uh, one of the best book of our time on islamic political thought uh, we are happy that uh, we have uh, will be joined soon inshallah uh, the author of the book dr mohammad muqtar shankiti uh, along with the prominent personalities uh, like dr ramir anjum dr shir ali darin dr mohiddin ghadi We wholeheartedly welcome all of you, uh, my dear speakers and all of the uh, participants here. Uh, to, st- uh, to start the discussion, conversation, I would request uh, Dr. Ghazi, Dr. Mujuddin Ghazi to present an overview of uh, the book as well as uh, your thought on the book. Uh, Dr. Ghazi, Dr. Mujuddin Ghazi is the secretary of the Sneefi Academy, Jamaat-e-Islami Hind and editor of uh, famous Urdu magazine, Zindagi Now. Uh, Dr. Ghazi has previously worked as Dean of Sharia Faculty in Al-Jamiya Islamiya Shantapura and he is the author of uh, uh, many books in Urdu and Arabic uh, as well as uh, many articles. So without uh, uh, making any further delay, I would request Dr. Ghazi to please start uh, 
presenting his uh, views and thoughts uh, starting with the overview of the book to sabse pehle urdu mein muhsin ghazi sahab ne chuki tarjuma kiya is kitab ka wo is kitab ki talkhis aur bhi pesh karenge hum log ke sath apne taasurat ke sath aur is tarike se hamari discussion aage badhega please bismillah arrahman arrahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyil karim amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in ma baad तो सबसे पहले मैं साई ऑफ इंडिया को मुबारकबाद देता हूं कि उन्होंने इस अहम डिस्कशन का इनका किया और उम्मीद करता हूं अल्लाह ताला से दुआ करता हूं कि ये डिस्कशन अच्छे नतज तक पहुंचे तो वक्त की कदर करते हुए मैं तमहीदों के बगैर कुछ खास खास बातें किताब के सिलसिले में आप हजरात के सामने रखना चाहूँगा ये किताब कि इस किताब की खसूसियत ये है कि पहले नंबर से ये बहुत ही सुलगते हुए बहुत ही जलते हुए और बहुत ही मुश्तल किस्म के सवालों का जवाब देने की कोशिश करती है ऐसे सवाल जिनको करते हुए भी लोग डरते हैं उन पर गुफ्तु करना दूर की बात है उन सवालों को जहन में लाते हुए डरते हैं लेकिन उन सवालों पर मुसनफ ने भरपूर अंदाज से गुफ्तु की है और अपना नुक़ नज़र पेश किया है उस नुक़ नज़र से जाहिर इख्तलाफ हो सकता है लेकिन नुक़ नज़र दलाइल के साथ पेश किया है दूसरी बात यह कि किताब इनकशाफात से भरपूर है जब किताब पढ़ने लगते हैं तो हर थोड़ी देर के बाद कोई इनकशाफ सामने आता है बहुत ही तहयर खेज इनकशाफ जिसको देख कर आदमी चौंक जाता है कि क्या ये भी है और क्या ऐसा भी हुआ तो पहले मैं सवालों के बारे में कुछ बात करूँगा तो एक बहुत बड़ा सवाल ये है कि जो किया जाता है कि आखिर क्या वजह है कि वो जो अल्लाह के रसूल सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम ने मदीना मनवरा की रियासत कायम की और उसमें गोया कि एक तरह से इस्लामी निज़ाम कायम किया तो वो इतनी जल्दी सिर्फ यानी तीस चालीस साल के अरसे में कोलेप कैसे हो गया ये उस निज़ाम की कामयाबी है या उसकी नाकामी है इतनी जल्दी किसी निज़ाम का कोलेप्स हो जाना पूरे तौर पर तो इसको क्या कहा जाएगा तो इसका जवाब उन्होंने ये दिया है और ये जाहिर है कि बहुत संजीदा और अहम सवाल है तो उसका जवाब उन्होंने ये दिया है कि दरअसल जब अल्लाह के रसूल सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम ने इस्लामी निज़ाम हुकूमत कायम किया एक तो उसका जो मकानी मामला था कि एक वो उस वक्त दो मसले थे एक तो जो अरब है अरबों की फितरत ये थी कि वो किसी ए, यानी निजाम को निजाम हुकूमत को उनकी तबीयत कबूल करने से इबा करती थी इनकार करती थी यानी उनका मामला ये था कि उनके शहरा ये कहते थे कि मिना हद आजिन का नाम आरूफ अल्ला असरुल मुलू की वक़्त लुहा व किता लुहा कि आज के जमाने से हमारे सिलसिले में ये बात मारूफ है कि हम बादशाहों को कैदी बनाते हैं उनको कतल करते हैं उनसे जंग करते हैं और यह कि ईजा बलगल फिता मलाना सभी उन तकर जबादुलसाजिदीन कि हमारे यहाँ अगर कोई बच्चा जो है शीर खार बच्चा जब दूध छोड़ता है तो उस वक्त उसके हैबत का ही आलम होता है कि जो बड़े बड़े बादशाह हैं वो उसके सामने सजदा करके गिर पड़ते हैं तो इस तरह से हुकूमत को इबा करने का मिजाज अरबों के दरमियान था तो ऐसी कौम में अल्लाह के रसूल सल्ला वसलम ने इस निज़ाम को कायम किया था जो अनार की पसंद थी वो निज़ाम को बिल्कुल गवारा नहीं करती थी और जो कबायली हल्का फुल्का निज़ाम चलता था उसी के मुताबिक वो चल रही थी तो ये अरबों का मामला था दूसरे जो आसपास मामला ये था कि दो बड़ी सल्तनतें इस इलाके को अरब अरब के इलाके को घेरी हुई थी एक तरफ ईरानी सल्तनत थी और दूसरी तरफ रूमी सल्तनत थी और ये दोनों सल्तनतें जो है वो सुल्तानियत के ऊपर यानी बहुत ही पुख्ता किस्म की मलूकियत पर कायम थी और तो इस तरह से ऐसी ये रियासत वहाँ कायम हुई जहाँ पर कि लोगों का मिजाज मुलू यानी निज़ाम के को नापसंद करने वाला और अनारकी को पसंद करने वाला था और दूसरी तरफ जो आसपास की बड़ी यानी आलमी जो सूरत हाल थी वो ये थी कि दो बड़ी सल्तनतें जो पूरे तौर पर ठेठ मलूकियत को रिप्रजेंट करती थी उन्होंने उसको घेर रखा था तो इस सूरत हाल में जब निज़ाम कायम हुआ तो उसमें के अंदर जो है वो नाजुकी बहुत ज्यादा थी जाहिर की जब कोई निजाम कायम होता है तो उसकी कदरें होती हैं उसके बाद कदरें जो है ट्रांसफार्म होती हैं मतलब ये कि कवानीन में और अमली सूरतों में ये ट्रांसफार्मेशन जो है वो वक्त चाहता है बहुत सारे 
लोगों यानी ताउन चाहता है बहुत सारी चीजें उसके होती है जब जाके उसके अंदर पुख्तगी आती है तो शिंकी जी का ये कहना है कि इससे पुख्तगी का मौका नहीं मिला इस्लामी कदरों को एक तो ट्रांसफार्म होने के लिए जितना वक्त चाहिए था उतना वक्त नहीं मिला नंबर एक और नंबर दो उनको जो पुख्तगी के लिए जो वक्त चाहिए था उस निजाम को उस पुख्तगी के लिए भी वक्त नहीं मिला तो इसका नतीजा ये हुआ कि बहुत ही आसानी के साथ यानी उस नातावा पौधे को उस नाजुक पौधे को ए, हालात की आंधियों ने उखाड़ के फेंक दिया ए, तो उसमें ए, उसकी फिर बहुत सारी तफसीलात है लेकिन ये जो उखाड़ कर फेंका है तो उसके बावजूद जो बीज है वो एक लाजवाल इम्कान की एक आबादी इम्कान की सूरत में वो बाकी रहा और उस बीज के अंदर ये सलाहियत है कि वो कभी भी अपने इम्कान को इस्तेमाल करते हुए हालात के साजगार होते हुए दोबारा वो एक पौधे की शक्ल और एक बड़े तनावर दरख्त की शक्ल इख्तियार कर सकता है तो वो ये तो मानते हैं कि ये पौधा गोया की उखाड़ दिया गया लेकिन वो ये भी मानते हैं कि बीज जो है वो बाकी है और उसके अंदर दोबारा एक तनावर दरख्त बनने का पूरा पूरा इम्कान बाकी है जबकि उस तरह के हालात मैसर आ जाए तो एक बात तो ये हुई दूसरा सवाल ये है कि अगर एक इनहराफ अमल में आया था जिसको शिकीती जो है सियासी इरतदाद का नाम देते हैं पितने कुबरा का नाम देते हैं जब खिलाफत जो मलुकियत में तब्दील हुई तस्पीन और उसके आसपास के वाकत के नतीजे में तो उसको वो सियासी इरतदाद का नाम देते हैं और फितने कुबरा का नाम देते हैं सवाल यह है कि सियासी इरतदाद या फितने कुबरा की जो सूरत हाल पैदा हुई या इनहराफ की जो सूरत पैदा हुई वो इनहराफ वो इस कदर पुख्ता क्यों हो गया और उम्मत में उसको जवाब क्यों हासिल हो गया कैसे हासिल हो गया यानी उसके बाद वही इनहराफ जो है वही असल उसूल बन गया और वही गोया की यानी चौड़ी शाहरा बन गया कि इसी पर अब उम्मत की गाड़ी को चलना है तो ऐसा क्यों हुआ तो उसके उन्होंने दो वजूहत बताई एक तो ये वजह है कि जो खून खराबा हुआ उस इनहराफ को रोकने के लिए जो खून खराबा हुआ वो इतना बड़ा खून खराबा था और पै दर पे जो कई खून खराबे हुए वो उससे उम्मत इतना ज्यादा बदशगुनी का शिकार हो गई कि उसके बाद फिर उसने गोया कि जब भी ये तस्वूर आए कि उम्मत की सियासी इसलाह करना है फौरन ही जो है वो फितनों का ख्याल वो दिमाग में जहन में आ जाता है तो गोया कि अब ये बना कि चूंकि सियासी असलाह के नतीजे में फितना पैदा होगा खून खराबा होगा इसलिए सियासी असलाह नहीं होनी चाहिए तो एक तो बात ये हुई कि फितनों का खौफ खून खराबे का खौफ वो शुरू से लेके अब तक वो उम्मत के जहनो दिमाग पर वो सवार रहा जिसके नतीजे में फिर कुछ और सोचने की ताब ही नहीं रही और इस सिलसिले में वो एक बड़ा इंकशाफ करते हैं वो कहते हैं कि इब्तदाई जमाने में जो इस इनहराफ को रोकने के लिए जो कोशिशें हुई थी इनकलाबी कोशिशें तवरात इनकलाबी कोशिशें जो हुई थी आगे चलकर उन इनकलाबी कोशिशों को पितनों का नाम दे दिया गया हजरत अब्दुल्ला इबन दुबैर ने जो कोशिश की उसे फितने का नाम दिया तो वी यानी साहबा की क्यादत में जो तवाबीन का जो मार्ग की जो तहरीक उठी उसको फितने का नाम दिया गया वो कहा कि क्यादत में जो इबन अशद की तहरीक उठी उसको फितने का नाम दिया गया और यहाँ तक कि और जो साहबा की रहनुमाई में जो मदीने में जो हर्रा के वाक़ जो पेश आया वहाँ जो तहरीक उठी उसको फितने का नाम दे दिया गया तो ऐसी सारी कोशिशें जो इससे पहले उठी थी इसलाह के लिए उन सबको फितनों का नाम दे दिया गया तो फितनों का खौफ वो जो है वो मुसलत हो गया उम्मत के सकाफत पर और उम्मत के दिमाग पर और यह हुआ कि उम्मत की इसलाह बनाम फितनों का अंदेशा तो फितनों के अंदेशे को हमेशा तरजीह दी जाने लगी और पूरी जो फिक वजूद में आई सल्तनत यानी सियासी फिक वो पूरी की पूरी वो फितनों के खौफ से के तले दबी हुई थी दूसरी बात उन्होंने ये इनकशाफ किया कि 
مسلمانوں نے عربوں نے مسلمانوں نے فارس کو فتح کیا دائرے کے روم اور فارس دو سلطنت ایسے تو مسلمانوں نے روم کو تو فوری طور پر فتح نہیں کیا اس کے کوئی صرف کچھ حصوں کو فتح کیا جو اس کے سرحدیں تھی سرحدی علاقے شام وغیرہ اور مصر وغیرہ لیکن جو اصل رومی سلطنت تھی ان کی جو اصل دا... یعنی دار السلطنت تھی وہ سب چیزیں باقی رہی جبکہ مسلمانوں نے ایران کو فارس کو پورا فتح کر لیا تو ایران کو پورا فتح کرنے کا نتیجہ کیا ہوا ایک نتیجہ اس لیے ہوا کہ ایک بہت بڑی سلطنت جو ایک بہت بڑا خطرہ تھی وہ گویا کی مفتو ہو گئی اور وہ خطرہ ٹل گیا لیکن انہوں نے کہا کہ مصنف کہتے ہیں کہ ایران کی ایک تاریخ ہے وہ تاریخ یہ ہے کہ وہ فتح تو آسانی سے ہو جاتا ہے لیکن پھر اپنے فاتح کو وہ اپنی تہذیب سے مغلوب کر دیتا ہے یہ ایران کی تاریخ ہے چنانچہ سکندر مقدونی جو کہ ایک یعنی یونان کو ریپرزینٹ کرتے ہوئے جا کے اس نے فتح کیا تھا وہ پھر اس کی ایسی ضرورت بنی کہ پھر اس نے یونان کے اوپر جو ہے ایران کو مسلط کر دیا اور ایرانی تہذیب کو اور ایرانی سیاسی ثقافت کو مسلط کر دیا تو اسی طرح سے مسلمانوں نے جب ایران کو فتح کیا تو اس کے بعد پھر ایران کی سیاسی تمدن نے اسلامی تمدن کے اوپر غلبہ حاصل کر لیا اور اس کی وہ ایک بہت ہی زبردست اس کی مثال وہ دیتے ہیں کہ جو عہد نامہ ارد شیر ہے یہ ایک عہد نامہ ہے جو ساسانی سلطنت کے بانی ارد شیر بادشاہ نے لکھا تھا لکھوایا تیار کیا تھا اور اس کا مقصد یہ تھا کہ اس کی نسل میں بادشاہت جو ہے پوری قوت کے ساتھ باقی رہے یہ جو عہد نامہ ارد شیر ہے اموی دور کے آخر میں اس کا عربی میں ترجمہ ہوا اور ترجمہ ہونے کے بعد وہ دار یعنی دار الحکومت کے نصاب میں شامل ہو گیا چنانچہ بغداد میں یعنی عباسی سلطنت میں آپ دیکھیں گے کہ ہارون رشید نے معمور اور امین کے مربی سے یہ کہا کہ تم ان, ان کو ان شہزادوں کو قرآن مجید کی تعلیم دو اور اس کے ساتھ جو ہے وہ عہد نام ارشید کی تعلیم دو ایک عباسی وزیر یہ کہتا ہے بڑا وزیر جس کا باپ بھی وزیر تھا اور دادا بھی وزیر تھا یعنی بڑا وزیر وزیر اعظم یا جو بھی کہتے ہیں آپ اس کو وہ یہ مذاق اڑاتے ہوئے کہتا ہے وہ کہتا ہے کہ یہ جو ارشیر کا عہد نامہ ہے یہ تم لوگوں کی بقرا اور عالم عمران سے زیادہ بہتر تو یہ ساری باتیں ہو رہی تھی اور پھر انہوں نے یہ بھی انکشاف کیا کہ قرآن مجید تو ظاہر کے ایک مصحف کی شکل میں موجود تھا لیکن اس وقت تک کوئی اور اسلامی کتاب اس وقت تک تدوین نہیں ہوئی تھی حدیثوں کے مجموعے نہیں تدوین ہوئے تھے فقہ کے مجموعے تدوین نہیں ہوئے تھے اس وقت عہد نام ارشیر وہ تدوین ہو کر ترجمہ ہو کر تدوین ہو کر دار السلطنت کے نصاب میں داخل ہو گئی تو گویا کہ جو قرآن مجید کے علاوہ جو پہلی انسانی تدوین امت کے نصاب میں داخل ہوئی وہ عہد نام ارشیر تھا جس نے یہ پورا مزاج بنایا پھر انہوں نے عہد نام ارشیر کا جائزہ لیا اور وہ بتایا ایک بات انہوں نے اور بتائی اور یہ بھی بہت ایک انکشاف والی بات ہے کہ یہ جو ملوکیت ہے آمریت ہے وہ اس طرح سے مسلمانوں کی ثقافت پر غالب ہو گئی کہ اس کے علاوہ جو چیزیں تھیں ان کو بالکل ہی نظر انداز کر دیا گیا یعنی آپ دیکھیں کہ اب باقی دور میں جب کہ یونان کا بہت بڑا لٹریچر وہ ترجمہ ہوا عربی میں ارستو اور افلاطون کی اور سقرات کی بہت ساری کتابوں کا ترجمہ ہوا لیکن ارستو کی جو پولیٹکس ہے ارستو کی جو سیاسیات پر شاندار کتاب ہے اور جو کہ گویا کی جمہوریت کا پورا تعارف پیش کرتی پولیٹکس کا ترجمہ نہیں کیا گیا وہ اب جا کے ترجمہ ہوا گزشتہ صدی میں احمد لطفی سید نے اس کا ترجمہ کیا افلاطون کی ایک کتاب ہے دلاد اور ایک کتاب ہے ریپبلک تو ریپبلک کے اندر تو کوئی جمہوریت کی بات ہے نہیں اس کے اندر تو کچھ اے, یعنی فضائل کا تذکرہ ہے المدینۃ الفاضلہ کا نقشہ بیان کیا گیا تو ریپبلک کا تو ترجمہ ہوا لیکن دلاب جو ہے اس کا ترجمہ نہیں کیا گیا تو اس طرح سے پھر یہاں تک کی تو یہ ساری بہت ساری باتیں ہیں جو آپ اس میں پڑھیں گے اس طرح سے انہوں نے یہ بتایا کہ یہ پوری جو تاریخ ہے وہ 
एक तरह से जो उम्मत की जो सियासी फिका है वो असल में सुल्तानी फिका बन गई और जो सियासी तमदन था वो सुल्तानी सियासी तमदन बना और उसमें इसकी गुंजाइश नहीं रही फिर जाहिर है कि इल्म कलाम भी उसी तरह का हो गया और फिका तो उसी तरह की बन ही गई तो ये पूरा जायजा है कि किस तरह से ये जो इनहराफ सिफीन के बाद वजूद में आया उस इनहराफ ने किस तरह से पुख्तगी हासिल की और जवाब हासिल कर लिया शिकी जो है वो दो चीजों में दो उसूल बयान करते हैं उनकी पूरी किताब जो है वो दो उसूलों के गिरद घूमती है एक उसूल है अमीर पर उम्मत की हुकूमत यानी अमीर जो है उसकी हैसियत उम्मत के अजीर की है मुलाजिम की है और उम्मत के इरादे के मुताबिक जो है अमीर को हुकूमत करनी है ये एक उसूल है जिसके मुताबिक जाहिर है कि हजरत अबू बकर और फिर खुलाफा राशिदी ने हुकूमत की और उन्होंने हमेशा अपने आप को उम्मत का अजीर समझा और इसीलिए हर फैसला जो है वो शुराइत के जरिए से उसके मुकाबले में दूसरी जो दूसरा जो उसूल है वो बगैर मशोरे की इमारत है ये जो उसूल है बगैर मशोरे की इमारत का शिंकी जी का ये कहना है कि ये उसूल है तो मौजूद लेकिन इसकी हैसियत रुखसत की थी और बतौर रुखसत के गजब जंग मोता में हजरत खालिद बिन वलीद ने इख्तियार किया उसको और बतौर रुखसत के उम्मत के अकाबिर ने हजरत माविया को इख्तियार करने दिया यानी ये जो अमल हुआ ये बतौर रुखसत के और एक इस्तना के तौर पर लेकिन फिर बाद में ये हुआ कि ये जो असल उसूल था अमीर पर उम्मत की हुकूमत ये बिल्कुल गायब हो गया और जो रुखसत वाला उसूल था जो हालत रुखसत और हालत इतरार के लिए था वही असल उसूल बन गया और उसी के गिरद जो है गोया कि पूरी फिक और पूरा इल्म कलाम का बड़ा हिस्सा जो घूमने लगा तारीख ये तजिया करते हुए ये कहते हैं कि अब तक की पूरी तारीख जो है वो ये रही कि इमामत की तलवार वो उम्मत की गर्दन पर मुसलत रही कि जैसे ही उम्मत के अंदर कोई बेदारी आए तो वो महसूस करे कि नहीं गर्दन पर इमामत की तलवार रखी हुई है और वो उसकी इजाजत नहीं है तो अब उनका तजिया ये है कि अभी ये जो अरब स्प्रिंग के नतीजे में ये जो एक नारा बुलंद हुआ शाह उरीद की आवाम चाहते हैं आवाम मांगते नहीं है आवाम हाथ नहीं फैलाते आवाम तकाजे नहीं करते बल्कि आवाम इरादा रखते और आवाम चाहते हैं आवाम का फैसला है तो ये दरअसल ऐलान है इस बात का कि अब उम्मत की तलवार जो है वो इमामत की गर्दन पर रखने का वक्त आ गया उसके हालात बन गए तो ये हालात कैसे बन गए उसके तो उसके लिए वो ये कहते हैं कि अब तक तो सल्तनतों का निजाम था और इसलिए ए, इस्लामी यानी मुस्लिम दुनिया में सल्तनत को फलने फूलने का मौका मिला लेकिन अब सल्तनतों का निजाम तो खत्म हो गया उसकी जगह जो है वो इलाकाई रियासतों का निजाम कायम हो गया है और इलाकाई रियासतों का निजाम जो है वो टूट करता है उसको उस उस रियासत को जो अल्लाह के रसूल सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम ने मदीने में कायम की तो मदीने में जल्लाह के रसूल सल्लाम ने जो रियासत कायम की थी उसका अब दुनिया के हालात ऐसे बन गए हैं और अब वो वक्त आ गया है कि अब दोबारा वो बीज जो है वो दोबारा एक पौधे की शक्ल इख्तियार करे और वो जो है दोबारा एक दरख्त बनकर वो बरगुबार लाए शिखी जी का एक कमाल ये है कि उन्होंने इस्लाम की सियासी कदरों को जमा करके तीस कदरों को पेश किया सोलह जो है वो हुकूमत बनाने की कदरें और चौदह जो हुकूमत चलाने की कदरें फिर उन तीस कदरों की अमली शक्ल क्या होगी इसको उन्होंने पेश किया और उसके बाद फिर मुख्तलिफ सवालों का जवाब दिया मेरा वक्त खत्म हो गया है उन्होंने जो सूफी फिक्र है जो कि मतलब ये कि इस्लाम को देखती है एक महदूद नजर से उसका जायजा लिया जिसको इमाम गजाली वगैरह रिप्रेजेंट करते हैं और बाद में फिर ये वाइल हल्लाक और बहुत से मुसलमानों ने पैदा करना शुरू किया और ये हुआ दूसरे सल्फी फिक्र है तो सल्फी फिक्र से मुराद जो है वो वो सल्फी फिक्र नहीं है छोटी सल्फी फिक्र बल्कि वो फिक्र जो कि तारीख के तजर्बे को जो खुलफा राशदीन के जमाने में हुआ उसी को दोबारा दोहराना चाहती है तो इससे कत नजर कि वो तजर्बा किस जमाने में था और अब 
اسلام کی سیاسی قدروں اور سیاسی اسلام کی جو سیاسی نصوص ہے ان کا تقاضا کیا ہے اور پھر ایک وہ تو سلفی سیکولر فکر ہے جو کہ گویا کی اسلام کے نظام حکومت کو مانتی نہیں ہے اسلام کے پاس نظام حکومت ہے تو انہوں نے جو ان سب چیزوں کا جائزہ لیا ہے اور انہوں نے یہ کہا ہے کہ سلفی فکر اس لیے قابل عمل نہیں ہے اور قابل قبول نہیں ہے کہ وہ انسانیت کے خلاف ہے اور سیکولر فکر اس لیے قابل قبول نہیں ہے کیونکہ وہ اسلام کے خلاف ہے تو اس طرح کی بہت ساری باتیں ہیں بہت ساری خوبصورت اصطلاحات ہیں انہوں نے سیاسی رہبانیت کی ایک اصطلاح دی جو بہت ہی معنی خیز اصطلاح ہے اور جس سے کہ وائل اللہ کی کی پوری فکر کا جو انہوں نے پیش کی امپوسیبل اسٹیٹ وغیرہ میں اس کا زبردست طریقے سے رد ہو جاتا ہے سیاسی تصوف کی بات انہوں نے کی اور وہ بھی جو ہے وہ اس کے ذریعے سے ان سارے لوگوں کا وہ سمجھ میں آ جاتا ہے موقف سمجھ طے کرنے میں مدد ملتی ہے جو کہ اسلام کو جو ہے وہ سیاست سے الگ رکھنے کی کوشش کرتے ہیں اور جو اصلاح کی کوشش ہے ان کو چاہتے ہیں کہ وہ سیاسی میدان کے علاوہ باقی میدانوں میں ہو تو یہ کتاب تو ایسی ہے کہ اس کے ہر صفحے پر کچھ نہ کچھ قابل ذکر بات ہے اور ہر پیراگراف اس کا جو ہے اپنے اندر ایک تحیر کا مواد رکھتا ہے لیکن بہرحال میں نے کچھ منٹوں میں بیس منٹ میں میں نے آپ کے سامنے خلاصہ رکھ دیا ہے باقی باتیں ان شاء اللہ آگے آپ حضرات پیش کریں گے میں دوبارہ شکر ادا کرتا ہوں ایس آئی آف انڈیا کا اور جو ہمارے ماہرین ایکسپرٹس شریک ہوئے ہیں شیر علی ترین صاحب عمیر انجم صاحب ان سب کا میں شکریہ ادا کرتا ہوں اور ان کو مبارکباد دیتا ہوں کہ وہ اس خوبصورت نشست کو خوبصورت بنانے میں انہوں نے حصہ لیا آخر دعوان الحمد للہ رب العالمین بہت بہت شکریہ جناب ڈاکٹر محدین غالی صاحب واقعی ایک بہت ہی چیلنجنگ ٹاسک تھا کہ ایک بہت ہی بھاری بڑے دخیم سائز کی بک کو بہت ہی کم وقت میں سمرائز کر کے اس کا اوور ویو پیش کرنا جس کو آپ نے بہت ہی خوبصورتی کے ساتھ پیش کیا اور ہمارے سامنے اس کتاب کا ایک بہت ہی اچھا اوور ویو جو ہے وہ سامنے آ گیا تھینک یو سو مچ ناؤ وتھ ایٹ موسٹ پلیجر آئی وڈ ریکویسٹ ڈاکٹر عامر انجم ٹو شیئر وتھ شیئر وتھ وتھ اس ہز ویوز اینڈ ریمارکس آن دی بک ڈاکٹر عامر انجم از دا امام ستاب چیئر آف اسلامک اسٹڈیز ایٹ دی ڈپارٹمنٹ آف فلاسفی یونیورسٹی آف ٹولیڈو Uh, he has been serving an editor of uh, Triple IT's English Journal, American Journal of Islam and Society for a very long uh, time. Uh, he is also part of Yaqeen Institute. He is the author of uh, Politics, Law and Community in Islamic Thought, the Tamian Movement, uh, which is published by Cambridge University Press. So without making any further delay, I would request Dr. Amir Anjum to share with us uh, his thought, please. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Because we have the... Uh, respected author here, uh, my good friend and brother, uh, Sheikh Mukhtar Shantiti, I will speak uh, in English, inshallah, but I'm happy to explain in Urdu uh, if needed. Does that work with everybody? Yeah, sure, sure, perfectly. Okay, excellent. So uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for organizing this, and in particular, uh, Ghazi Sahab for such, a, uh, such an eloquent and uh, pithy summary of a very long book, um, which makes my task easier. Um, uh, Dr. Ghazi presented a very strong uh, uh, defense of the book. And I wanted to start with that. I wanted to um, emphasize Uh, how much I agreed with many of the theses in the book. Um, but because he has done that, I will uh, emphasize merely some of the points that I agreed less with or I disagreed with. Um, now, it seems to me that the, uh, the book is very much written in the moment of the Arab Spring And in the moment where um, the, the rising of the Arab youth, the millennials, if you will, uh, to demand, you know, end of their corruption government, corrupt governments, corruption in their government, not quite democracy always, but some kind of accountable government. Um, this moment, uh, presents for the author a unique moment from which the rest of the history 
a unique and privileged moment from which the rest of the history can be uh, not only seen, but picked out as being what is important and what is not important. Um, I think that's always a challenge when you read history outside of the profession of history, where you have a number of people trying to read from their perspectives and you have to engage with them. But when you present a sweeping view of history from one perspective and one moment, uh, that always introduces limitations. And that's why uh, some of the ones that I see I will present. One thing that I see in, uh, in Dr. Shampiti's presentation of history is it is uh, extremely moralizing. It is meaning it is always bad guys and good guys, right? You know, so for instance, you go to your, your school's kid and you have kids fighting some kids are bullying, some kids are, you know, uh, well fed and, and, and well clad, you know, they have nice clothes, others don't, others are dirty. So you have a very clear sense of their good, good kids and bad kids. And then when good kid fights a bad kid, you always know who the good kid is, you always know what who the bad kid is. And bad kid is bad because he's bad. Uh, that's the kind of sense one gets from Dr. Shankiti's book. Uh, meaning what's missing here is that perhaps the kid who is bad is bad only today, or perhaps the kid who is bad has problems at home, perhaps, you know, he didn't take his medication, perhaps, you know, uh, the good kid is good because maybe he's really wealthy, you know, all kinds of other existential factors. Once we study in politics, society, in, in sociology, in psychology and economics, all of those things disappear when one is uh, interpreting the Umayyads, the, the Alawids, the, um, uh, the, the early politics, this politics of the early fitna um, or, or the first few fitnas. And all that seems to be left is some bad guys and good guys. Now, I happen to agree with the fact that uh, Ali radiallahu anh was right in, 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 in Safin, but, or, or, or even before that, at Jamal. Um, I have uh, a book that I haven't published, um, working on it. I've been uh, teaching it, teaching from it as a draft for uh, several years now, but, um, I'm not satisfied with it precisely because I don't quite I'm not so sure of my interpretations. Um, but one thing that I see, for instance, is that that would perhaps improve uh, the historical depth of Dr. Shankiti's account is um, things such as the generational change that is taking place, the kinds of sweeping generalization that he makes, for example, the Arabs not having government. Well, Southern Arabs, certainly Yemenis did have uh, governments. Um, and they played a very important role, in fact, throughout Islamic history early on, uh, even in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and, and uh, even um, in the Umayyad government, uh, the Yemenis played an important role precisely because they were, they were more used to government. Um, so the idea that there was complete anarchy in Arabia, right? Uh, although there is, of course, an impulse, especially among northern uh, nomadic Arabs against government and our anarchic impulse, but early Islam is more complex. Similarly, the accounts of what happens, now I'm going to change gears and talk about the historiography of who writes the history. Uh, that history is written mostly in Iraq, in, in the most anti-Umayyad province. And it is written for the most part, compiled in the Abbasid period, of course, which, is, which starts as a rebellion against the Umayyads and demonizing the Umayyads is central to its existence. Um, these facts, which bother historians, uh, don't seem to bother Dr. Shankiti because he's looking for a reason for why things went wrong. Right. And I often tell my students that, look, when you are trying to study a complex life of even one person, let alone an entire civilization, you can 
write a way, you can write history in a way that looks at what went wrong. And, and you can find reasons. So for example, you have an empire that lasted 500 years. And you know, at, in the final years, you could say that people were decadent, or they were stagnant, and they weren't thinking. You can say, well, and you can go all the way back to the very founding and say, well, look, uh, the founder of this empire, or this system, wasn't very good at thinking, and that finally led to the, 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 the decline and, and, and breakdown of everything 500 years later. That, you know, that's one way of doing history, and it's possible. It, it is not necessarily invalid. And you can look at the exact opposite way, and you look at what, you know, government is difficult. People are difficult. There, there is no moment in history. There's no, no, no government in history. There is no, including what Dr. Shankliti takes to be the end of history, the modern nation state, the modern democratic liberal democratic nation state, it is an extremely short-lived and extremely tumultuous uh, experiment with unprecedented wars um, and unprecedented tumult, cultural, political, right? Um, so because that is the case, and as a historian, what I'm surprised by and what I am, um, you know, in awe of is how does it work? How did they make it work? How did they start with um, uh, with tr tribes with with no pres no go present government and many uh, competing values? How did they form a government? And then when uh, things you know when the fitna started when the civil war starts, how did they bring it back? Uh, how were they able to conquer and and you know? Uh, what was it that made Islamic law, uh, Islamic, Islam, Islamic religion, and uh, the Arabic language prosper and thrive um, against extremely advanced civilizations and against extremely adverse circumstances? Politics is always hard. And that's why what I want to look at is what made it work, not what, uh, what made it break down. Again, I, th I think that um, we will do ourselves a disservice um, if we just look at one, of, uh, one side of, 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 of this coin, right? You have to take both into account. For instance, I guess, just to press this on a little bit, um, it is true that with Amul uh, Jama'a, with the year of peace, when, um, when Muawiyah, Radiallahu becomes the Khalifa uh, or or king. Uh, we have a compromise reached, uh, but that compromise, if one looks at this just from the perspective of, um, you know, a, a pure moralistic idealism that is trying to explain what will happen fifteen hundred years later, you would say, okay, well, this is terrible. But if you are looking at the world from that moment, the project that the Prophet وسلم, and, and the first two caliphs and people with them had built was coming apart. And it was very likely, again, you, we tend to look at history from hindsight, but it was very likely at that moment that this is all coming to an end. There was no guarantee that Islam is going to continue and that Islamic power was going to continue, that uh, all of these people that had been just only recently brought under Islam, that they were not going to go back. None of this was taken for granted. And therefore, there were multiple considerations in the minds of the people who are at that time acting and making decisions, whereas in our mind, there is a single consideration. Uh, why was there not enough, uh, you know, Shura, for instance, the way we perceive it. So I think that it is okay, it is acceptable to assign blame, but after doing all of that work, right? It's kind of like when you have a bully in the school, you could at the end punish the bully or penalize, understand, but you have to also analyze, you have to understand the context. But 
the simplistic account throws all of this out and simply says the Umayyads did it, right? But it's also the fact, for instance, that the Umayyads saved the unity, the Umayyads saved the entire uh, western coast of Syria from Byzantine attacks that um, Ali radiallahu an, who is my hero and I love him, but there was not an argument that he did not turn into a war. Um, whereas, and he ruled over six years of civil war, whereas Muawiyah was able to bring peace for 20 years, which allowed Muslims once again to live in peace. Um, the both on the east uh, eastern border, Central Asia and and the west, um, Muawiyah was able to bring uh, well to, to to restart jihad, which then in fact prevented encroachments both by Turks on on in the east and and the Byzantines on the on, on the, in the west. Um, Marwanids, for example. Um, were the ones who established an Islamic Arabic government um, the, from the basic bureaucracy and coinage to, uh, you know, and the language was the most important thing at the time. You couldn't imagine um, an Islamic government continuing if um, your bureaucracy was no longer in your, in your was, was not in your language. You couldn't understand. You remained outsiders being governed by Greeks in the West and by Persians in the East effectively. And it took uh, very courageous uh, steps by Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Um, and uh, similarly, tribalism was put down by the brutal dictator uh, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Tribalism and the, the Thawra of Abdul Rahman ibn Ash'af was not primarily on ideological grounds, it was primarily on was tribalism fighting against a central government. Uh, so we cannot go around and simply recruiting all the people you know, on our side or, you know, their, or their side. There was much more complexity, which I see missing in this account. All this to say that at the end, I will agree uh, with many of the things that Dr. Um, Shankiti has suggested, meaning that Yes, the loss of Shura and a Shura-based government was difficult, was a loss, something that must be recovered, but it was far more complicated and that there were far more continuing attempts to keep things alive. And that what did happen uh, was a result of many complicating factors that haven't disappeared. And it is quite possible that had Ali, for example, if you're, if you're doing uh, counterfactual history, had Ali Radiyan continued uh, and had there been, uh, you know, he, there was complete rebellion in his own camps in Iraq, for instance, um, you know, his own army in Iraq is split in, into three. And uh, as Al-Hussein, uh, Al-Hassan Radiyan, his first son, uh, who, who became Khalifa after him, had to experience the fact that you know he was himself being stabbed by his own army and he could not keep control and uh, giving the control over to Muawiyah was in fact uh, the better politically uh, better option for him. Those are all realities in Ali's camp once you actually go and do, do history. So it wasn't simply good versus evil. It was uh, a lot of other things going on, which I try to explain to just give one example in the early period. Um, it's a generational um, problem in my view. Ali radiallahu belongs to an Islamic generation which did not know the Arabs well, unlike Abu Bakr and Umar. And Muawiyah came from a generation of people who had come to Islam late and they were very much like the vast majority of the Arabs who had converted, come to Islam after the big Futuhat um, and or, or right uh, at the moment of the big Futuhat of, of, of Persia and Rome, which means that if had there been a democratic election at the time, um, you know, pardon the, all the anachronism that's involved in this, 
Muawiyah would have won by landslide because most Arabs were more like Muawiyah, not like Ali, meaning that they had not been raised in Islam and Muawiyah knew how these Arabs thought and worked, which is why there are many such incidents you find in books of history, which explain why people were able to understand Muawiyah better. Um, but Ali radiallahu this was not a curse upon Islamic civilization that continued. In my view, within a hundred years, the Umayyads lost not only politically, but ideologically. It was the narrative of Ali and it was the virtues of Ali, uh, which both for Sunnis and for Shia, and the, the vision of Islam of Ali uh, that won out, that becomes consolidated, in my view, more among the Sunnis than even among the Shia. But nevertheless, uh, there's no doubt that it is Ali who wins out ideologically, intellectually, um, but it takes time. And I'm much more interested in seeing a, a complex account of that history so that we can do the same in the contemporary period as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amir Anjum, for sharing your thoughts with us on the book. Uh, now I'm going to uh, call with extreme pleasure Dr. Sher Ali Tareen to share uh, his thoughts and remarks on the book with us. Uh, Dr. Sher Ali Tareen uh, is uh, assistant, as, Associate Professor of uh, religion, Religious Studies at Franklin and Marshall College. Uh, his works focus on Muslim intellectual traditions and debates in early modern and modern South Asia. Uh, he has written, uh, written extensively on uh, Islam, uh, especially inter uh, interaction of Islam, secularism in modernity. He's the author of uh, Defending Muhammad in Modernity, published by University of Notre Dame Press. Uh, so without uh, delaying further, uh, I guess he's uh, re recently completing a book, uh, namely The Promise and Peril of Hindu-Muslim Friendship. So now without delay, I would request Dr. Sherali Tareen to please, sh uh, please share his thoughts on the book. Bismillah ar-Rahman uh, ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, Zulkar Nainbai, uh, for your invitation, uh, for organizing this great uh, gathering. I want to congratulate and thank SIO for this excellent event and for this book series. Uh, it's very important, uh, I think, and uh, an excellent uh, avenue to connect, uh, you know, um, students of Islam based in North America, in uh, uh, the Arab Middle East and in South Asia. So it's a great service that you're doing. And uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be uh, interacting uh, with Professor uh, Shinkiti. Uh, thank you so much for writing uh, this extensive meditation uh, from which I learned a lot. And it's really an honor uh, to be in conversation with uh, Professor Ove Maranjum. Um, it's morning time here and what better way to start a day than learning from uh, Professor Ove Maranjum. And I also want to really thank and congratulate uh, Professor Mahyuddin Ghazi for uh, doing really an excellent translation of the text. Uh, I had the fortune of reading both the Arabic and the Urdu versions, and he really, it's a, quite a massive accomplishment. And I think in a world in which uh, translation uh, sometimes uh, is not acknowledged as a form of scholarship, I really want to especially acknowledge the difficult task that has been performed by Professor Mahyuddin Ghazi. So uh, in my comments, I just want to touch on a couple of um, larger methodological conceptual questions that uh, arose for me when I read this text. Um, and um, uh, Zulkar Nan had requested me to do half and half. So I'll spend 12 minutes of my 20 minutes in English, because uh, um, the author, of course, is with us. And then maybe eight minutes briefly, I will switch to Urdu uh, to elaborate a bit on those points as well. Um, so I'm deeply sympathetic uh, to the larger project that Professor Shinkiti uh, has launched here, which uh, uh, was beautifully summarized by Professor Ghazi, but in some ways this project is about excavating a form of Muslim politics, an understanding of Muslim politics that is based neither on simplistic inheritances from the tradition and neither on submitting to the sovereignty of secular power. Uh, so that's what I see him trying to do, uh, some kind of a reinvigoration of an Islamic politics um, that does a form of double critique uh, of forms of tradition that he does not find helpful in terms of resuscitating the political in the current moment, and also that does not uh, easily succumb to the pressures of modern secular power. And that 
uh, project is one that I'm deeply sympathetic to. And I also want to acknowledge here that in this text, Professor Shankiti uh, really takes intellectual risks, takes political risks, and that's, uh, I think, something I want to applaud. And uh, in his critiques also, uh, I think one really, as a reader, gets a good sense of his own positionality, uh, which also makes him, I think, vulnerable to critique as well. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, sort of uh, intellectual risks that he takes. The underlying argument that I saw of the book um, is this disconnect between revelation and history. So Professor Shankiti time and again throughout the book makes this reference to the underlying values of uh, Muslim politics, of an Islamic politics, al-qiyam uh, that's a, that's a key term of this, of this text, which he sees as having been evaporated, as having been undermined, as having been disfigured by history over the course of history, it has been sort of through the accumulation of history, uh, which sees the rise of forms of politics, uh, imperial forms of politics in Muslim societies that underlying revelatory impulse of an underlying Muslim politics gets uh, either uh, hidden or it gets disfigured and he's trying to revive that, he's trying to resuscitate that through that, through his work. So I just want to raise that as the first kind of question for all of us to think with. And uh, my comments will be more broad in terms of uh, some larger questions that we can all think about and have Professor Shankiti respond to, which is this whole relationship between revelation and history, whereby uh, Professor Shankiti makes quite an emphatic claim, which is that it really is in the first 40 years of Muslim history that we see this kind of a prophetic politics at work, uh, especially in terms of the model community of Medina that is based on a logic of mutual coexistence and a, a logic of ensuring the integrity of human relations between Muslims and between Muslims and non-Muslims. And over time, in Professor Shantiti's history, this logic of a mutual coexistence or a politics based on the integrity of human relations uh, gives way to a form of politics that is based on coercion, that is based on a certain kind of a coercive form of sovereign power. Um, and that, in some ways, he sees as a decline or as a kind of disfiguration of uh, this underlying possibility of Muslim politics that he's now trying to reinvigorate in a way that is compatible to contemporary conditions as well. So I just want to raise that as the first question, uh, the re relationship between revelation and history. And the two sort of questions I want to raise there, or possible sort of tensions that, that a reader might, might raise, is first of all, you know, isn't revelation also grounded in some notion of history? Even if, of course, as believers, we believe in the transcendental sort of truth of, uh, um, of revelation and these source texts uh, uh, from, you know, the Quran or the normative model of the prophet, uh, but they, of course, are grounded in a particular kind of history, the prophet's life, the era of revelation of 22 years in which much transforms within Muslim society, so that revelatory time period, the sort of so-called golden period, uh, as one might categorize it in Professor Shankiti's text, that also, of course, was marked by tremendous historical change, transformation. Um, so, so this kind of a narrative whereby you have a golden 40 years, that, that, then that which then gets blanketed and hidden and disfigured by a number of centuries in which you have the rise of different disciplines like Muslim jurisprudence and different categories of Darul Islam, Darul Harb, etc., which all of all of which Professor Shankiti sees as a deterrent to the resuscitation of prophetic politics. So, what kind of historical frame is that, whereby you have a forty-year golden period and then some centuries of a uh, sort of a decline or a period of, if not darkness, but 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 move away from prophetic politics? which now in the contemporary moment, we ought to resuscitate. So how would, how would uh, you respond, Professor Shantiti, if someone sort of uh, were, to, were to argue that this is falling into the trap of a certain kind of a rise and fall model of history, whereby the historical uh, dynamism of that very 40 periods that is being privileged as a period that is beyond history, uh, where, where does that historical dynamic figure into this whole relationship between revelation and history that you're drawing on? Where does it leave, for example, you know, prophetic sayings and hadiths such as, you know, uh, my community is like rain shower. One does not know whether the beginning of a rain shower is better or it's a later part. Uh, so that relationship between revelation and history is one point that I just want to raise as a point of discussion, as a point of further elaboration. What 
theory of revelation in history do we see reflected in this in this text so that's point number one the second point i want to raise has to do with the final part of the book uh, which has the, the part in which professor kiti goes about trying to apply the theoretical foundation into the contemporary moment uh, whereby he mainly argues that we need the way to get the muslim community out of this crisis so the crisis basically is this disconnect between revelation and history this disconnect between the original moment of islam and its prophetic politics and how history plays out in 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 contemporary conditions uh, in contemporaneous conditions and the solution that he offers is a form of politics a form of uh, the uh, in organization of the political that revives and resuscitates the political values of early islam uh, but does that in a way that is um uh, uh resistant of secularism that is uh, that does not succumb to secularism but is yet um compatible with the modern state so that's a claim that president kiti makes early on also in the book and comes back to towards the end as well so there i found a certain kind of tension um and a certain kind of conceptualization of the secular of secularism that i think needs a bit more elaboration and there i would say that you know let me take as a point of departure to make my point your critique of professor wail halak um i thought that critique was interesting but perhaps a little more polemical than productive and perhaps professor halak's argument in the impossible state is a bit more nuanced than the idea that he's preventing the formation of any kind of islamic politics so this idea of the impossibility of the state is not so much the prevention of a, a understanding of a, the political in islam but rather to question the viability of the modern state as a form of institutional structure that would make possible the resuscitation of prophetic politics and underlying that argument is the notion that secularism is not so much the the erasure of religion or even the uh, this, this idea that religion ought not to figure in any kind of politics but rather it is a form of reorganizing the very category of religion it is a form of uh, reconfiguring the very category of religion in a manner that is closest to a certain modern western christian protestant notion of what religion ought to be and that is conducive to the sovereignty of the modern state in other words secularism as a phenomenon is integral and ex- and inextricable to the very structure and contradictions of modern state sovereignty so this idea of forming a certain notion of the political in islam that is both resistant to the secular and yet is indebted to and is uh, inextricable to the modern state i think that needs some further reflection uh, that i think is there is some tension there uh, that i think can be gainfully addressed if one does perhaps a bit more of a charitable reading of a thinker like halak i'm not here defending halak but i'm just pointing to a uh, i think a, a a a deeper analysis of his of his text i think it's not so much preventing islam from becoming political or closing the doors of politics or or glorifying pre modern islam or romanticizing it but rather to make the argument that uh, uh the modern state and its very structuration is so intimately connected to the paradoxes of secularism that any kind of islamic politics that takes the modern state as its point of departure and as its organizing logic will run into some irresolvable contradictions there are the paradoxes of modern secularism so i think some reflection on this question needs uh, needs elaboration um so so i'll just uh, raise those two points and just uh, for 5 minutes i'll just maybe uh, speak a bit in urdu for the audience as zulkar nayan had requested me to fir se bahut bahut shukriya aapki is daawat ka मैं सिर्फ दो निकात इसी नुक्ते को आगे बढ़ाते हुए दो निकात में पेश करना चाहता हूं शनकीति की इस किताब से और बुनियादी तौर पे जो दो मनहजी में सवाल उठाना चाहता हूं वो ये है कि एक तो प्रोफेसर शनकीति की किताब में जो हम बहस देखते हैं कि किस तरह एक बुनियादी इस्लामी सियासत का जो नजरिया है जो माखूज होता है वही से और वही के मबादी से और जो कुरून सलासा की उन्होंने मिसाल दी एक जो मिसाली सियासत है वो किस तरह आहिस्ता आहिस्ता पोशीदा हो गई और मस्क हो गई और वो कोशिश कर रहे हैं कि जमन मुआसर में कैसे उसका इहिया किया जाए 
تو اس میں اس کے حوالے سے جو سوال میں نے اٹھایا ہے وہ یہ ہے کہ یہ جو ایک نظریہ وہ پیش کرتے ہیں وہی اور دینی متون و نصوص کا تاریخ سے جو تعلق اور ربط اس کے حوالے سے جو وہ ایک نموزج فراہم کرتے ہیں اس کی کیا حیثیت ہے اور اس کا ہم کیسے تجزیہ و تحلیل کر سکتے ہیں تو بنیادی نقطہ ہے وہ یہ ہے کہ اگر کوئی اس مفروضے پر کار فرما ہے کہ جو پہلے چالیس سال ہیں یا قرون سلاسہ ہی لے لیں بے شک پہلے تین سو سال لے لیں پہلے تین جو اجیال ہیں اسی میں ہم ایک مثالی سیاست دیکھتے ہیں اور باقی تمام جو ادوار ہیں اسلامی تاریخ کے اور اس کے مفکرین اور علماء اور تمام جو سیاسی تیارات فکر ہیں گویا وہ کسی قسم کی تاریکی میں جو ہے وہ داخل ہو گئے تھے اور ایک ایک ملوکیت اور سلطانیت کے کے تاریخ سائوں میں وہ جو ہے بالکل پوشیدہ ہو گئے تھے تو اس قسم کی جو ایک تاریخ اور دینی سوچ کا آپس میں جو ربط و تعلق ہے اس کا جو نظریہ ڈھانچہ پیش کیا گیا ہے اس کتاب میں اس کی ہم کیسے تحلیل و تجزیہ کر سکتے ہیں تو بنیادی پہلا نقطہ میں نے یہ اٹھایا دوسرا نقطہ جو میں نے اٹھایا ہے وہ یہ وہ نقطہ میرا خیال ہے بہت آسانی سے میں بیان کر سکتا ہوں اگر میں ڈاکٹر غازی کے ترجمے کی طرف رجوع کروں کہ وہ فرماتے ہیں یہ صفحہ نمبر اکتیس پر فرماتے ہیں اس کا خاتم ہے بنیادی طور پر فرماتے وہ یہ ہیں کہ اس کا جو حل ہے یہ جو عظمت ہے یہ جو 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 جس کا بحران ہے آئینی بحران ہے اس کا حل ایک ایسا ہونا چاہیے جو نہ تو سیکولرزم کے ڈھانچے میں ڈھلے اور سیکولرزم کی مدافعت کرے سیکولرزم پر مستلزم نہ ہو اور ساتھ ہی ساتھ وہ جدید جو ریاست ہے اور اس کے جو معیر ہیں اور اس کے جو اقدار ہیں اس سے بھی ہم آہنگ ہوں تو سوال جو میں نے اٹھایا وہ یہ ہے کہ اس میں سیکولرزم کی تاریخ جو ہم دیکھتے ہیں شاید وہ خاصی بسیط ہے اور سیکولرزم کو ایک ایسے ظاہرے اور ایک ایسے نظریے کے طور پر دیکھنے کی ضرورت ہے کہ سیکولرزم صرف دین کو سیاست سے یا ریاست سے الگ کرنے کا نام نہیں ہے جو داگانہ انداز میں دیکھنے کا نام نہیں ہے مگر سیکولرزم ایک ایسی طاقت کا نام ہے ایک ایسے ظاہرے کا نام ہے جو دین کی جو تعریف ہے اور دین کا جو تصور ہے ضمن معاصر میں اس کو ایک ایسے انداز میں بدل دیتی ہے اور ایک ایسے تغیر پذیر کر دیتی ہے جس سے جدید ریاست کی حاکمیت کے لیے وہ سود مند ثابت ہو تو گویا جدید ریاست کی جو حاکمیت ہے جیسے ہم کہتے ہیں ماڈرن اسٹیٹ سوورنٹی انگریزی میں اور سیکولرزم کے جو تناقضات ہیں جو پیراڈاکسز ہیں اس کی جو آپس میں ہم آہنگیت ہے اس کو اگر ہم ملحوظ خاطر رکھیں تو یہ جو نظریہ ہے کہ ایک ایسی اسلامی سیاست جو سیکولرزم کے خلاف بھی ہو یا سیکولرزم کی مدافعت بھی کرے اور ساتھ ساتھ وہ جدید ریاست سے بھی ہم آہنگ ہو یہ جو ہے اس کی تلاش اور اس کا استخراج کرنا قدر مشکل ہوگا اور یہ میں دیکھتا ہوں بنیادی توتر جو ڈاکٹر شنکیتی کی کتاب میں منہجی اعتبار سے پائی جاتی ہے میں دو نکات پر اپنی بات کو سمیٹتا ہوں پھر سے بہت بہت شکریہ تھینک یو سو مچ ٹو ایس آئی او ٹو ذوالکر نین ڈاکٹر غازی ڈاکٹر ویمرن کورس اسپیشلی ڈاکٹر شنکیتی فار گیونگ سو مچ ٹو تھنک ود اینڈ سو مچ ٹو لرن فرام یور بک تھینک یو سو مچ فار دس اپرچونیٹی تھینک یو سو مچ ڈاکٹر شیرلی تری فار یور ویلیبل ڈسکشن ریزنگ کوشچن شوونگ سم کائنڈ آف ڈز ایگریمنٹ اور مے بی لائک رادر لوکنگ فار سم مور ڈیٹیلڈ analysis on some uh, specific points. So, uh, dear brothers and sisters, now it's time to hear our chief guest and the author of the book, Al-Azmad Dasturiya, Al-Hazar Al-Islamiya, Islami Tamadun Me, Aini Bohran, Dr. Muhammad Mukhtar Shankiti. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Mukhtar Shankiti is a professor of political thought at Qatar University. Previously, he taught at uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University. He is uh, the author of uh, many well-known books in Arabic, like Al Khilafat al Siyasiyya Bain al Sahaba, Asar al Hurub, Al Salibiyya, Al Al Ilaqat al Sunniya wa Shiyya, and so many others. Uh, his research area includes politics, history, philosophy, and Islamic studies. And uh, interestingly, he is an academician as well as a political activist. Uh, he has written hundreds of articles on different socio political issues at different journals, uh, portals, uh, websites, uh, and magazines. So I would request very, uh, very respectfully Dr. Shankiti to share his response, his uh, views, thoughts with us. Please, Dr. Shankiti. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nain, and uh, thanks for uh, all the participated in organizing this event. I'm really very uh, delighted today and also before 
uh, when I met uh, Dr. Ghazi about two years ago in Kerala, and I was very excited when, when he said that he's ready to, to translate the book into Urdu. I have a deep belief that, uh, that uh, anything I can offer that uh, in writing, I like it to be translated to Muslim languages. I still believe that people will interact in deep hearts with ideas only in their own language. That's why I was very happy that the book is translated into this great language to uh, uh, many people uh, in the Indian subcontinent. So uh, I really, uh, uh, very, I'm really very grateful to Dr. Razi for his uh, translation. And I'm sure uh, he's a very competent translator, so unfortunately I don't speak Urdu. But uh, I know very well how he's, how he's very eloquent and, uh, and competent in Arabic language because I read some of his books in Arabic. Um, I'm also very, really happy to meet uh, my beloved brother, Boehmer, today again. We've been in, at Hamad Ben Khalifa University together. Unfortunately, he didn't stay for long with us uh, there. Uh, I'm hoping he might have second thought and come back. To, uh, to the university again or to Qatar so we can meet him again and to benefit from his knowledge. Uh, mashallah, and his uh, akhlab is always uh, uh, extraordinary high character and uh, great brotherhood. I'm very uh, lucky also and happy to meet uh, Brother Shah Ali today for the first time and uh, very happy that he's interested in reading this humble work. Um, well, really, uh, you know what, in, for, for the sake of marketing the book, I don't want to talk about it. I want to ask people to read. That's, uh, there is self-interest. You know? I don't want to read it on behalf of the readers, especially that everyone can read the text, of course, in a different way. Um, I, I won't talk about the book in general because I'm sure uh, Dr. Ghazi uh, has done that uh, the uh, perfect way. Uh, I want to uh, interact a little bit with the uh, remark of my two brothers about the book. Uh, it looks like uh, the historical part of the book has, is, is more attractive than the other part. So uh, both of you are uh, attracted to the historical part more, especially uh, Brother Weymer. Uh, all of his comments uh, are concentrated on the uh, chapter three of the book, the, uh, which is talking about uh, what I call Farag ala al Imperatoriyat, you know, that the political void in Arabia, or what we can, we can call it in English the Arabian anarchism and the Persian monarchism. And uh, I think these two phenomena are very important. Actually, I didn't expect uh, Brother Weimer to, uh, uh, to say that I've been too much moralizing in the book because I've been much more moralizing in the other book on Khilafat Siyasi Ibn al-Sahab, which is, uh, I didn't talk much in that book about the historical context. And I try to correct actually that to be closer to the historical context, whether inside Arabia or around Arabia. There's a, the interaction between these two contexts, the Arabian anarchism, and I don't, I don't mean that uh, there was no uh, states in ancient Arab history, but uh, I, I mean the, probably I didn't explain that very well. What I mean actually was the period, pre-Islamic period, about 100 or 150 years, before Islam, but actually, if we if we look at the ancient history of Arabia, there have been some um, states and monarchies, and uh, archaeology is proving a lot of sophisticated uh, social and political life before. Uh, also, I didn't mean the whole Arabia, but I mean I'm focusing, of course, on the place where Islam was born, which is uh, basically Hijaz and close to Hijaz, Hijaz and Najd. Uh, 
Um, yes, I, I agree with you that uh, there are a lot of uh, sweeping generalization because these have been the extraordinary adventure. As I as explained at the beginning of the book, the many books I, I read about the Islamic political thought in modern time, I found it some of them focusing on principles, and that's the school of Taqsid. And some are focusing only on history, and that's the school of Tariq. And some are absorbed with uh, struggling with the modern solution. So what I try in the book is uh, trying to combine the three together in one volume. And I know this kind of general sweeping uh, writing uh, will never satisfy the uh, specialist uh, like Weimer and Shir Ali and other specialists, of course. I mean, the professional historian will not get enough good history and the professional political scientist will not get enough also political philosophy. Uh, same thing for people who are looking for a uh, solution today. But I felt from uh, following the, uh, the, the, the Muslim library on this topic today that there is a need to put together all of these in one volume to make people look at the big picture, even if there are some problems in the details. We, there will always be a problem uh, in details. In my interpretation of history, uh, it's, not a, it's not novel, actually. I mean, uh, I built a lot on some reflection of Iqbal um, and Malik ben Nabi, specifically. Uh, maybe uh, too much from Hegel also, uh, whom I admire for many years, in some aspect, at least, of his uh, philosophy of history. Uh, and like any contemporary or modern reading of 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 uh, the past, it it's it has some kind of selectivism always, and it has always some uh, reductionist, uh, unavoidable uh, reductionism. Of course, uh, one of my uh, my nice professor at uh, Texas Tech University, where I study history of religion. She's a nice lady and one of my favorite professors. She used, she used to teach us a course on history and memory. Uh, history and memory. And she used to say, um, to create a new future, we have to create a new past. Uh, so we always are reading and rereading history. Um, of course, academicians try always to uh, um, to claim they have no motivation, but I think motivation is always there whether it's explicit or implicit. And uh, we cannot avoid that. Um, for uh, for Ritna al Kubra, I, I, like, uh, I like my brothers and sisters to read my book on Khilafat Siyasid al Sahaba. It has much details. It's also more moralizing, uh, uh, <laughs> but it has more, more focus on this specific. Uh, topic. Uh, I would have been more happy if uh, my brothers also commented on the first part and the last part of the book more. For example, I didn't see comments on the uh, first and second chapter on Islamic political values uh, or on the, uh, except uh, for the uh, remark of uh, Brother Shar Ali about uh, about halal. Well, let me come to the uh, issue of halal. In the Arab context, you know, everything also needs to be contextualized. Uh, interaction with uh, Arab Christian intellectuals in the Arab world uh, might be different from the interaction with them outside the Arab world for many cultural and sociological and historical. Uh, factors. I don't read the book. I don't see the book of Halak only uh, on its own, but I see it within the whole writings of, of Halak in on Islam, and that's why um, might not. I'm not. I'm not giving him that 
much benefit of doubt that some people are giving him because uh, the way he's presenting Islam in other books also. Uh, even when he talk about modernity and all of those, all of this criticism of modernity in which he combined the new moral, uh, in my perspective, the new uh, Christian moralism with, with also the uh, French deconstructive <laughs> way of, of Foucault and others. I find a lot of uh, inconsistencies in, in Halak's uh, thesis, not only in the, uh, in the uh, uh, impossible state, but also in, in the other books. For example, after criticizing almost all of the reformers uh, in one of his books, um, like Abdu and Rida and all of those, I, he came back to, uh, to present to us Shahrur and Ashmawi as the representative of uh, a new and mature Islamic approach today. So I find a lot of self-contradiction in Halab in this way. He's not, a, he's not for me, a, he's not a consistent traditionalist or a consistent uh, modernist. Uh, and that's one of my problems with his, with his writing. But anyway, that's, that's not the main, uh, the main issue of the book. Uh, the, main, uh, the main things, the main uh, idea or ideas I try to uh, convey in this book is first that Islam has extraordinary uh, political potential that is still viable uh, and still a great source of inspiration, should be a great source for inspiration to Muslims and to the whole, all humanity. And I, I, I don't think, at least from my simple study of the history of religion, that there is a much space for uh, political morality in any other religion or any other scripture uh, uh, more than Islam or anything that isn't comparable to, to Islam. That's, that's the first point. The second point is that the Islamic, the, the political crisis, Islamic civilization is very old, but, and here I want to come back to Brother Women. Those who read my book, of course, might feel that I'm not doing justice to Islamic history or to Islamic civilization, but actually my book is not about Islamic history or Islamic civilization. It's about, it's about political legitimacy in Islamic history and Islamic civilization. So it's about a very specific point, which is in my view, one of the weakest points in Islamic history and Islamic civilization. That doesn't mean that Islamic civilization was not great in spirituality or in architecture or in jurisprudence or many, many other achievements. Of course, there are many other achievements under the Umayyad and under the Ottoman and under the Abbasid and many others. And I, I cannot deny that. And actually, uh, I'm very proud of that legacy. But when you focus narrowly on the issue of political legitimacy, when you see just a few decades after the death of Prophet Sallallahu the first generation are uh, drawing their swords and fighting each other in that fierce uh, uh, fitna. Uh, of course, there is a problem. No doubt there is a problem. We can study it from a moral point of view and who's, who was right and who was wrong. And we can study it from a historical and contextual point of view. And I, I think both uh, approaches are correct. Just uh, we need to clarify what kind of approach we have taken. Usually those who take the moralist approach uh, don't, don't give much attention to the historical context. And those who focus on the historicity of all of those events, at the end of the day, they end up also with some kind of moral neutrality and that uh, nothing, all, all had, I mean, there is nothing that could happen better than what, what happened. As they said in Arabic, they said, the imkan can what happened is that that was that's the only thing that was possible, but this is against one of the uh, key uh, uh, analysis uh, key uh, or analytical keys of 
uh, in my book, which is the concept of al imkan tarihi or historical potential. That yes, what happened happened, but there are different. Maybe it could have happened differently. I I don't believe that Ali. Let's, let's suppose that Ali uh, uh, came up victorious from al Fitna al Kubra, and he became Khalifa for twenty years. Uh, none of us can say seriously that Ali will not defend the borders of Islam against Byzantine, for example, or against the uh, the uh, Central Asian people or any others. I mean, we know we know his personality and we know his history with Prophet and others. So whatever uh, Muawiyah achieved in this regard doesn't mean that Ali would not be able to achieve it. So here, this is the importance of the historical potential that which is not. We should not only focus on what happened, but also I think we should focus also on what could have happened differently. And that's give us more uh, way to analyze uh, what happened. Well, uh, I don't wanna talk too much. The book is a, a great adventure, actually is the adventure of my life. Uh, as, a, as you know, it's a very sweeping long text talking about um, moral issues, historical issues, talking about the Western modern philosophy, talking about modern state, others. But, uh, and, and because of this sweeping nature of the book, I don't expect it to be satisfying to any specialist in one of those specific area, but I hope it will be helpful to give uh, uh, the grant or to help people see the grant picture and also for the general readership uh, to be helpful. Final point uh, about what that uh, brother Sherali raised about secularism and the modern state. And that's one of the big issues that I have problem with Halab about. I think uh, uh, there is a lot of distinction between democracy and secularism. And uh, I, I I will inshallah share with you a study that I just published in Arabic, um, uh, Democracy Without Secularism, Demokratiyatun Bila Almaniya, or Demokratiyatun Duna Almaniya. And I think this is a very important point to think about because uh, the way uh, Halak and some uh, people are thinking about modern state, uh, to me is, too deterministic uh, way of looking at things. And also it's really, uh, it doesn't look at the, I think doesn't look at the details because uh, what I did, one of my favorite research projects that I work on in the last few years is the text related to religion in every constitution in the world today, the constitution of about 190 countries in the world. I collected all of those constitutions. I took all uh, articles in those constitutions related to religion or secularism and try to look at it together to see the different color of secularism or religiosity in, in different concrete experiences today, not just philosophical debates about secularism or secularization. And what, what I come to is, I think some, I come to some surprising to me at least uh, conclusion on this. And I will be very happy to share this paper with you inshallah. Uh, I think I have a WhatsApp of uh, Professor uh, uh, Oemer, uh, or I can get it from uh, Karnain. So uh, I will share it with you inshallah to see. Probably it's a continuation of the discussion about at least the last part of, of the book. Um, revelation and history, well, you're right. That's really, for me, it's like obsession, not only in this book, by the way, but in my other books, especially the book on Khilafat Siyasir ben al-Sahaba. Well, I see it just the relation between absolute and the relative, and uh, there was always a gap, regardless of what has been achieved. There was always a gap, even, but, there is a gap that is, cannot be blamed morally, and there is a gap that can be blamed morally. 
So when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Aisha, لولا أن قومك حديث عهد بالشرك لأقمت البيت على قواعد إبراهيم. That's a gap. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died wishing to do something, but the historical, social, cultural condition were not were not ready for for that. So even in the life of prophets, there is a gap between the ideal and the reality because of the human uh, condition. But that cannot be blamed. But when we have something that is explicitly against Islam principle, and it's not, uh, it's not imposed by, by solid realities, uh, that's a different issue. And that's one of my problems talking about Muawiyah or Amr in, in my previous book and on this one. But, but by the way, uh, Dr. Oemer, I think I've been much softer <laughs> in this book uh, about this. And that's why uh, I like the, uh, the quotation I, I, I quoted Al-Aqqad when he said about Muawiyah. So he said he was, a very, he was a very competent man, but not a great man. So he's looking at it from different angles. Nobody can doubt the competence of Muawiyah or Amr ibn Asi or Khalid ibn Wali or more, much of those leaders, Umayyad or Bani Makhzum leaders. Uh, and uh, that's something that can be taken uh, separately from the moral uh, judgment, I think. And also, uh, again, we need to look at what could have happened. Uh, so when you look at what could have happened, when you look at an imkan tariqi, I think we can uh, be fair with them without uh, sacrificing the principle. My book on Khilafat Siyasib and Sahaba has a subtitle, Risaletun vi makanit al-ashkhas wa qudsiyat al mabada so uh, trying to balance the sanctity of the Islam principle and the same, same time the respect for those very important personalities of Sahaba and also others who are not Sahaba. How can we achieve this balance? I try in that book. I'm not sure that I succeed, but that's what, always, uh, uh, that what I try always to do is to balance between the sanctity of principle do not sacrifice the principle, principle in order to defend the personality or the image of Sahaba. At the same time, of course, Sahaba uh, has to be have to be respected, and uh, they are part of the foundational moment of Islam, and they have their makana uh, that, of course, every Muslim has to keep in mind. Anyway, I'm sorry uh, I talked too much. I, I didn't want to, but you know. Uh, that's how professors like, they like to talk too much, uh, usually. Thank you very much. I'm really uh, thankful for all of you. I'm very grateful and uh, uh, very happy that my book now can be read in, in Urdu. Uh, it has been translated to French also and, uh, and uh, Turkish, uh, Kurdish, and uh, other, uh, languages and I hope I hope one day I will find someone who will translate it into English uh, but so far I'm not possible it's not possible so far so Jazakumullah khairan may Allah bless you and uh, I thank you very much for your interest in the book your uh, very deep comment uh, I agree with much of your criticism and I know there are a lot uh, thanks to uh, criticizing the book, uh, it's a huge project and it's a kind of um, a multidisciplinary work. And of course, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, good scholars like you will find many, uh, many problems in, in it. But I, I hope those problems also won't prevent from getting some benefit from this humble effort. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, dear Dr. Shankidi, for uh, this uh, wonderful, engaging discussion, uh, elaborations, and uh, highlighting so many different points uh, uh, about the book and uh, about the discussion. Uh, we have been organizing this uh, session, this uh, book discussion series, for more than a year. 
but the very uniqueness of uh, the today's discussion would be that uh, we'll have two rounds today. So previously we'll be having only one round. So, but uh, the second round will be will be very brief. I'll request all of the speakers to uh, to conclude in uh, two to three minutes, maximum three minutes. Uh, their further views, their uh, remarks, their uh, thoughts. So let's start with uh, uh, Dr. Actually, uh, sorry, uh, actually, uh, my family just uh, landed about 15 minutes ago to, in the airport of Istanbul. And uh, I need to run quickly to the airport. So uh, yeah, if we can be brief, the second down. All right, so please thanks. make it uh, uh, shorter, please. So let's start with the, Dr. Shirley Tareen. No, thank you, Dr. Shinkite. I'll just maybe take you know, two minutes to just elaborate on one this point about if the larger argument is that um, that a certain kind of an imperial Muslim politics uh, was oppressive and was more based on coercion rather than mutual existence, uh, as opposed to the prophetic model. Um, the question arises that, you know, there are very few institutions in human history that have been more coercive and more oppressive than the modern state. So I realize that one cannot completely imagine or the modern state is here to stay and it's not going anywhere. Uh, but if the larger very project is of imagining a notion of the political that is less based on coercion, I think the question that needs to be thought about is that pre-modern empires, no matter how coercive they may have been, the underlying relationship between the, the, the polity or the, the state and its people was one of what one scholar has called subsidiarity, meaning which is not based on this kind of an enumerated logic of the modern state, which counts people through census and has all these records. And in today's world, uh, you know, the kind of oppressive forms of governmentality that the modern state is characterized by. So the larger question of you know, one cannot, I think, bypass the problem of the secular by just calling it something else, that we won't call it secular, we'll call it madani, or we'll call it civil, etc. I think that underlying intimacy between modern political secularism and the oppressive sovereignty of the modern state cannot be bypassed uh, just by giving it a different name. Surat Kalam mein galti mein kar gaya, mein kehna cha raha tha ki ek aisa siyasi dhancha jo secularism se mukhasmat bhi kare, और साथ साथ जदीद रियासत के ढांचे में भी खुद को डाले मैंने मुखासमत का मतलब मुदाफत कह दिया था सूरत कलाम में तो मैं तसी भी करना चाह रहा था इस बात के तो ये एक दुख मुद्दा है इसको मैं छोड़ना चाह रहा था थैंक यू सो मच नाउ लेट्स हियर डॉक्टर मोहिद्दीन गादी साहब प्लीज नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू से समथिंग अबाउट द रिलेवेंस ऑफ दिस बुक इन द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ इंडिया बिकॉज़ मेनी पीपल आस्क मी व्हाई डिड यू सिलेक्ट दिस बुक टू ट्रांसलेट इनटू उर्दू what is the relevance relevance of this book in india why should read here in india this uh, uh, big book so i would like to explain the issue because uh, they understand that this book is uh, the relevance of this book is only limited to arab world because it is uh, discussing about the arab spring and the history of arab so on. but i would like to say that its uh, relevance is uh, very much in india and in other part of the world like uh, uh, the part out of uh, the india see now we have uh, many systems in islam we have economical system we can put this system in the table part of and we say that this system is very much beneficial uh, and uh, this is the blessing of uh, allah to the human kind likewise we have the family system the social system the financial system banking system and we very frankly we put this uh, these system in the table for task but uh, in relation to the uh, political system we don't have courage we are not able to put the uh, system which uh, the current and the present and the traditional version of the islamic political system we are not able to pull, put it in the table for task here in india also because if we say in india that we are looking for uh, it, uh, we would like to present upon you the polit islamic political system to adopt it yes, that is very much uh, uh, better than the other uh, system so uh, we are not able to do this why because the present version the present traditional version 
has many issues which are very uh, contrary to the uh, values which are accepted by the human kind. Uh, suppose the issue of the discrimination. Discrimination now is a very big abuse. Uh, if you say that we would like to establish a political system which supports uh, uh, support the discrimination among the among the citizens, uh, women and men and women, Muslims and non-Muslims, and uh, other. So, if any system is based on discrimination, that is not uh, able to be discussed. So, th this book, the uh, the beauty of this book is that it has uh, presented the political Islamic political system in the version that we can frankly uh, put it on the table for talk and we can explain the beauty of the Islamic political system and how it is very uh, beneficial and very good for thank the you, thank you, uh, thank human you. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's uh, hear Dr. Uh, Oamir Anjum, please. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. So it was, it's, it's really a pleasure to, to hear the uh, all of you in particular, my brother, uh, Mukhtar Shankiti's very kind and gentle response. Um, I didn't talk about the uh, political theory part of his book because I thought everything that he was saying really emerged from his struggling with that history and the history of revelation remained the central problem. And I think that if, if we could go, if we could come to an agreement that we need to do more there, then it was easier to say that we need to do more um, in the rest of the recommendations made in the book. Uh, now, just to give you an idea of why I think that this idea of, uh, of, of the modern nation state as a uniquely historical re-Islamicizing re uh, opportunity is questionable, that in fact, there is something to Halak's argument, even if uh, I don't agree with, uh, you know, maybe perhaps a good, good chunk of his argument, but I deeply respect it. In fact, you might see my book as a response to his argument, his book. His book came out next year, the year after mine, but his article on which the book is based had come out earlier, and I cite that in the, the beginning of my book as, as, as one of the arguments that I'm struggling against and writing against. So uh, I'm very much in conversation with Halak, but I'm in agreement with, with uh, Professor Sher Ali Tareen here and Halak and Talal Asad and many others who say that you misunderstand secularism if you think that it's simply about taking religion out of the picture. The modern nation state uh, always uses religion everywhere. So looking at formal constitutions is useless because all nation states are going to try to use whatever mechanism that is necessary for them to control their populations. And religion is always is and will always be an important element of that control. And in that sense, uh, modern Islamic reformers, uh, and I count, my, count myself very much among them, uh, you know, so I don't mean to point single you out, uh, uh, Dr. Mukhtar Shankitli. But um, we are very much in this, in this dilemma that by trying to Islamicize the nation state, embracing many of its uh, concepts um, and, and looking through its, its lens to Islamic history, we have serious um, difficulty and uh, liabilities rather, I should say, risks. Um, and one of them I want to point out is, for example, uh, Sheikh Rashid Ghanoushi, who wrote uh, forward to the book, um, was also part of this Tunisian, uh, you know, the Tunisian experiment where it very quickly went from being Islamic democracy, uh, Islamic pluralist democracy, to Muslim Democrats, just like Christians. Literally, that's his position now that we have given up Islamism or Islamic reformism or Islam altogether. Um, and the opponents of Islamic reformers have been saying this for a long time, that you guys will drop Islam the, the minute that you need to, given your priorities. And that's what Rashid Nushi did. And 
that's why there is a theoretical problem that we, and I'm not saying you, I'm saying we have to confront uh, because we do think that uh, Islamic history need to be critiqued. I agree with you that the problem of Islamic political legitimacy is a, uh, is a sore uh, point in Islamic history, but nevertheless, um, we should not be so complacent about the modern nation state because we have seen the results over and over and we have been warned about the theoretical and historical um, possibilities as well. Uh, so that's all. This is inshallah for another conversation. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. For Thank being you so much. So for, 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 for final words, please, uh, Dr. Mukhtar Shankiti. And unmute yourself, please, Dr. Shankiti. Dr. Mukhtar Shankiti, you, you are mute. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, so I have two points. One about the modern state that has been mentioned many times. I have less less pessimistic view of, of the uh, people are calling. So uh, uh, I have less, less pessimistic view of the modern state. I think uh, Halak and others in, their, in this uh, dramatic, pessimistic presentation of the modern state, they miss one point here. Yeah. Yes, I agree that. Mod to me, every modern state is totalitarian, but totalitarian here doesn't mean oppressive. It means it's just intervening in almost everything in our life. But there is something also about, this is the negative part about modern state. But the positive part is people are participating in this intervention in their own life. So it's no longer uh, an emperor for example, it's not an emperor who's intervening in our uh, every aspect of our life. No, there are institutions that we can contribute in building, we can provide input, etc. And I think that's that's a missing part of the uh, criticism of the modern state that uh, many people are doing today. They don't they look at the positive, the negative side of the modern state or the development that led to the modern state, but they don't look at the uh, positive side. Plus, also the term modern state itself is very ambiguous because which one is, is a Stalin, also a Stalin state is a modern state and Canada is a modern state. So which one of them is oppressive? And uh, are, they, are, are all of these the same? Is for example, the liberal Canada same as North Korea, for example, today, or Assad regime, uh, those are all modern states, at least in, 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 in the general sense. So I think, uh, I think we need to take one, one element is missing, which is people's ability today to, Im to impact how the state function. Uh, when, 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 for example, someone like Halab is talking, uh, Idealistic, uh, idealistically about Muslim scholars in the past Abbasid time and they are free and legislation is in the hand of the scholar and there is no influence of the state on them, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's really idealization. That's not 100% correct. Plus, which one, uh, who is more uh, free or from the government influence a Muslim scholar in the Abbasid time, for example, or a congressman, uh, an American congressman today, which one is more free from the will of the executive uh, authority today? Is it a scholar in the Abbasid time or uh, a, a, a parliament member, for example, in a Western liberal democratic state today? I think uh, no need to idealize uh, the past also at the same time, and no need to demonize the modern state. I think we better look at both in a more, uh, more uh, complex way to see both positive and the negative in the, um, in the old uh, experience and the new, uh, new experience. Uh, so uh, I, I guess that's what I have to say. I am getting uh, too many calls because family uh, I've reached Istanbul, sorry, I have to run away to, uh, to get them. Uh, they, are, they are waiting in the airport. And uh, I'm you, really very, very thankful uh, to all of you, uh, brothers and sisters who attend this discussion. And uh, I wish uh, all of you will read the book. 
and uh, I will also be happy to get any more criticism. You can send me any comments through uh, Dr. Ghazi or Badr al Karnayn or any of, of our others. Yeah, actually, there were so many questions from the audience that uh, because Good of the limitations of time, we'll not be able to take it. Uh, so let I'm me sorry. express. Yeah, I have to run away, so uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. So let, let me express a deep gratitude uh, uh, from uh, Sayu on behalf of Sayu. Uh, first and foremost, our speakers, especially the author of the book, uh, Dr. Mukhtar Shumkiti, the speakers, Sher Ali Tareen, Wami Ranjum, Dr. Buddin Ghazi, who through their uh, valuable comments and discussion engagements made this evening uh, in a way memorable evening, uh, which is not, uh, inshallah, going to be forgotten. And I thank all of the participants for uh, making this time and enjoying this beautiful evening. Uh, next book, inshallah, we'll be discussing about the theory of evolution written by a great scholar and scientist uh, from India, Dr. Rizwan, Deputy Director of uh, CSR, Center for Study and Research. Uh, so the details announcement will be made uh, sooner, inshallah. So see you again, inshallah, in the next discussion. And uh, good night. Uh, have a good time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.